Yep. Uh, hello to everyone who's tuning in. Thank you for joining me today um, for this online lecture. Um, my name is Ivor Prickett. I'm a freelance photographer uh, who works mainly for the New York Times, um, based in Istanbul and covering the Middle East and Turkey for the past 10 years or so. Um, I'm originally from Ireland. Uh, I studied documentary photography in the UK uh, between 2003 and 2006. So I've been a working photographer for about uh, 15 years now, which is pretty hard to believe. And um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the work that I have uh, been doing primarily for the last four years, five years, to be honest. Um, uh, which charts the um, the battle that in many ways is still ongoing to uh, defeat ISIS in, in the region, uh, primarily in, in Iraq and Syria. Um, uh, the, the work is uh, all commissioned by the New York Times, all shot on assignment for them, um, although I am freelance. Um, and... Uh, culminated in the form of a book that was published uh, uh, and released in 2019 by Steidel called End of the Caliphate. Um, and most of this work is an extract from that book. Uh, there's a little afterthought at the end with some work that um, didn't, didn't make it into the book in time, but I'll, I'll explain that when I get to it. So I'm going to dive straight in and... and um, uh, just talk you through those those years and and the process of doing that work. Um, it's worth noting that someone is keeping an eye on the the live comments on YouTube. So if anyone has any questions, uh, please just uh, type them there, and um, we're gonna we're gonna try and answer them at the end. I'm gonna speak for about 45 50 minutes, I think, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. So just uh, keep you know, keep track, keep an idea of any questions you might have. Um, I'm going to throw a lot of <laughs> information at you probably. So, um, yeah, just bear with me and then we'll, we'll hopefully get a chance to answer questions. So uh, this is actually a uh, illustrated map uh, done by the brilliant Molly Crabapple, uh, who's a fantastic illustrator and artist based in the US uh, who knows the region very well. And uh, I asked her to do this map uh, to go at the beginning of my book. So I like to open these talks with this this map um, because, well, I love it so much, and I think it's I think it's a really uh, uh, brilliant way to give you an idea of of the kind of uh, places we're going to be talking about um, between Syria and Iraq, and uh, the key cities of Mosul and Raqqa, where where a lot of this work was made. Um, so, as I said, I started, I mean, I've, I've been covering the region for, for nearly 10 years, uh, dating back to, to 2009, 2010, when I first moved here, uh, which was obviously just before the, um, uh, what are now, you know, seen as uh, the, the Arab Spring uprisings in uh, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya. Um, and you know, in many ways, a lot of the work that I've done since then, including <laughs> this, this work that I'm going to talk about, about the, the fight against ISIS, um, are the, the, the after effects of, of those years, those uprisings. Because as you know, uh, uh, as much as uh, they were popular uprisings and, you know, um, there, were, there was a lot of hope in, in the region at the time, uh, the knock-on effects are still being felt today, and ISIS, in many ways, is one of the uh, one of the uh, out, was one of the outcomes from uh, particularly the uh, the uh, war in Syria. Um, and 
Yes, I came to, you know, I came to covering Iraq by 2012, 2013, I started, you know, started working in, the, in, in, in Iraq um, and Syria uh, around that time. And um, by the time, you know, ISIS were uh, in control of, of, of the region and uh, the Iraqi forces backed by the Americans were ready to, to try and take back those regions. I, I pretty much based myself in northern Iraq uh, in 2016 to cover the, the the operation to retake Mosul because it was, you know, it was destined to be a very complicated operation. There were hundreds of thousands of people still stuck in Mosul, uh, civilians who were caught between, you know, essentially ISIS and the oncoming forces. So it was going to be a humanitarian disaster in many ways. And this is something I've always been interested in as a photographer is the humanitarian consequences and the consequences on civilians as a result of conflict. So that was that was what I went there to, to really try and focus on. And this is a picture from that early period of, of the, the operation to retake Mosul as people were fleeing. And, and this is, you know, this is where I really started to begin my work on the outskirts as the uh, you know the army was pushing in, um, and you had this outflux of people who were fleeing the fighting as soon as they were able to, and and this is how it started. You know, it was a gradual process of uh, uh, probing, going a little bit deeper, going a little bit further each time. But um, in the beginning, it was largely to do with uh, the the civilian fallout for me. Um, such as this and then this is further a little bit further inside Mosul uh, once I started getting access to the city and you know the armed forces were were inside the city and uh, you started to be able to see the uh, the city itself and the destruction that uh, was um, taking place uh, because of the the you know the nature of the the fight which was you know it was urban warfare and isis were embedded in the city and trying to make their their last stand there um, but at the same time you had people who didn't flee who were still living there and this uh this picture encapsulates that these are people who perhaps could have left at this point because this area has been liberated but they they've chosen to stay and and keep living in their in their homes in Mosul while a full blown conflict is going on. So in this case, the front line was probably only like a kilometer away, and yet people were trying to survive, get on with their daily lives. You can see here. This is, I mean, this is food and and uh, um, essentials being transported across this bombed out bridge, destroyed bridge, um, and. You know, again, this is uh, this is this is early on in the in the in the fight, um, and and you know this is further uh, further down the line, probably in in early 2017. Um, by the time the Iraqi forces had moved into western Mosul, which was the the second and, and last phase of the uh, of the fight, and was particularly treacherous because there were really so many people caught in this area. Um, and they were, you know, they they had been trapped essentially for the previous uh, um, four months or so as the war was going on, and in 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 many ways trapped in Mosul for the previous uh, three to four years under ISIS control. So they were really desperate. This was an aid distribution just after an area had been liberated in western Mosul, and. Um, uh, uh, an NGO, a government NGO, with the help of uh, soldiers, were giving out food, basic, you know, basic food that people didn't have. <clears throat> and this was actually at the same time. Um, and this, you know, this kind of scene, in a way, was very hard to see uh, inside the city. And this was at the point where I was. Uh, mainly working uh, while embedded with uh, with the Iraqi special forces who were operating on the front lines and the ones uh, really kind of uh, leading the fight against ISIS. And so um, uh, it was only if you were embedded with forces like, like them that you were able to see these scenes inside the city. Um, 
And, and this is how I did most, most of my work in the end through embeds, because once the fighting was inside the city, you had to be, you had to be embedded largely because it was, uh, I mean, it was blocked off. You couldn't, you couldn't get access unless you had some, some permission, some context, and uh, more importantly, it wasn't safe unless you were uh, embedded and, and protected uh, essentially by this, by the soldiers you were with. So this is a good example of, um, what it could look like when you were on these embeds, it wasn't uh, it wasn't always to do with uh, civilians, but you were uh, you were having to move with them wherever they wherever they were going and and go on patrol with them. And um, uh, it was of course incredibly dangerous and fraught with danger um, when you were on these missions. Um, but it was for me it was critical to be there and. And and not to take pictures like this necessarily of of the soldiers of the of the war itself, but of uh, the the consequences um, for the people who were caught in it and the destruction that was taking place in Mosul, which was uh, Iraq's second largest largest city, home to millions of people before. So um, that's that's why I was I was there and I was doing these these embeds. Of course, at times my attention turned to the the soldiers themselves and the fighting that was taking place. But I will say that really, you know, this is not not what interests me so much about conflict or being in these kind of places. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is a, a critical picture in many ways that shows the level of destruction that was taking place in Mosul. This at the hands of, of ISIS, uh, a lot of the destruction that was eventually done was to, you know, was as a result of airstrikes carried out by uh, US and coalition forces together with, you know, um, the Iraqi forces on the ground. But this is, this is uh, one of the occasions where ISIS used their most feared weapon, which was a car, like a, a, a suicide bomber driving a, an armored car packed with explosives and uh, driving, you know, driving them directly at uh, the Iraqi soldiers who were, who were pushing into, pushing into the city. And what they would do is, you know, they would, they would leave this bomber behind as they fell back and he would hide somewhere in a garage or, you know, under a tree so he couldn't be spotted by the surveillance planes overhead. And then as soon as the forces got close enough, he would come out and attack them. And so it, it was uh, probably the, the, the this was the scariest thing, both for, for the soldiers and for us journalists who were on the ground, because usually there would be very little warning and um, you would just have to, to run and scramble for cover when you heard this uh you know this this infamous um, word over the radio that a suicide bomber was coming, and uh, this was one of those occasions where it it came very close to to where uh, to where the soldiers were and where I'd been like five minutes before that, um, and and then this is the the immediate aftermath of that, um, and uh, the you can see the huge crater that it left in the road. Um, this is. Uh, a pretty tough picture to look at, but uh, in a way was uh, an imp important um, uh, turning point um, for me and in my coverage. Um, uh, the first time I really, you know, I really saw the devastating toll that the war was taking on civilians. This was a, a man who uh, had been brought to a medic station uh, with uh, the lifeless body of his um uh, of his brother who had been killed in a mortar attack by by ISIS just moments before um, and you know this was this was uh, the hardest kind of hitting moment for me and it really made me realize what was what was important about this story and what you know what I was there to try and do um, which was to show the level to which people were caught in in the midst of this fighting um, this is an early morning uh, before going out with some of the uh, special forces guys I was embedded with, and these were the kind of rooms where we were where we we were sleeping um, while you were on these embeds. Where they were people's houses that had been taken over and were being used as temporary bases. 
um, and he's praying uh, in the morning, very early in the morning before we go out on a on a on an operation such as this. Um, it's not the same day, but a similar similar kind of um, operation or mission that I'm talking about. They were clearing clearing this area, which included this huge unfinished mosque. Um, where they were always afraid of ambushes and booby traps, so be a very tense, you know, a tense day. And I would usually hang back a bit, not be right in the front, but like um, two or three waves back to make sure that nothing happened, you know, when these guys went in. But um, these were these were the kind of um, uh, operations they were going on, and I was joining them on. Um, this is, uh, something you would come across sometimes when they would take over, a, um, an ISIS area. Um, and so this area had literally been taken over earlier that day and you could still find, um, uh, flags and, and other, you know, traces of the ISIS members who would have been living in this house earlier, earlier that day. I always found this really unnerving in a way you could almost you know sense that they were they were still there and you know uh uh there was always a worry that someone was going to pop out of a uh a tunnel or a cupboard and um and uh, uh attack or yeah usually detonate themselves um so i, I yeah i find this uh, this picture uh quite important in a way. And this is again talking about the civilian, uh, the, the, the fact that civilians were so caught in the middle of, of the fighting. Um, this is yeah early morning uh, as an area was being cleared and, and taken, um, uh, taken back from ISIS and these civilians are you know managing to flee um, after years of being stuck and so yeah you would you know to witness this kind of moment was really powerful because uh usually i was the only you know i was the only um photographer or journalist in these situations and i remember on this morning these people themselves asking me which way they should go to get out of the city um because there was no one no one really else around at that at that time the soldiers were further forward uh, anyone uh, in the rear was further back and we were in this kind of no man's land. Um, yeah, and, and this is, you know, this is the other side of it. People who were still living in, in Mosul and had chosen not to leave getting, um, uh, you know, getting killed and, and injured while the fighting was going on. And this was one of those, uh, one of those cases it was perhaps the most visceral for me because we were, you know, less than a hundred meters away from where this this happened. A mortar landed outside these people's um, uh, house in western Mosul, and there was a small market on the street outside, and um, a number of people were were killed and a lot injured, uh, including this uh, this uh, woman's son who was who was killed on the street outside their home and and then uh, had been brought back inside into the courtyard uh, where they tried to, to save him, but there was very little they could do. Uh, he, was, he was too badly injured. And, you know, we heard this happening and then um, were able to, to come out and, and see the, the devastation and the, the aftermath of, of uh, what had happened shortly afterwards. <clears throat> This is, I mean, this is as, as close as you could get in many ways. Um, uh, this is actually an undetonated car bomb um, that ISIS had sent towards the Iraqi forces who I was embedded with and uh, was then detonated, taken out with an airstrike. And so I was able to uh, pull back to a safe distance, a couple hundred meters away, um, and, and take this picture, which is, uh, yeah, the, uh, the closest you would probably want to get to, to a, a bomb like this going off. Um, 
and yeah, this picture comes uh, after that in the book because uh, this shows you the uh, the aftermath of you know what it what it looks like when one of those car bombs goes off in a civilian area. So this this uh, young man is standing over the body of his father who was killed while going to the shop and was walking home when ISIS uh, an ISIS car bomber. Um, uh, detonated his car bomb uh, on the street outside their home where there was uh, a lot of Iraqi forces stationed and this was the moment he'd managed to yet yeah, come you know come back after the um, the the fires had kind of died down a bit and, and found his father and I was you know I just happened to, to be nearby when this happened and had had uh, had pushed uh, gradually towards the scene and was there just just as this happened so again this is i i know uh, troubling you know troubling to look at but really this is what i was what i was there to do and and what i felt was important to do was to show the level to which civilians were being affected by this by this conflict and it's you know it it's a very tricky it was a very tricky uh question to uh to ask in mosul because in many ways, um, ISIS did have to be stopped, and a lot of people who were stuck there didn't, you know, didn't want them to continue ruling, and they were uh, they were causing mayhem across the world at that point. So something had to be done, but uh, the the way in which it was done, or the way in which um, people felt it had to be done with this masses masses of uh, firepower was very troubling because of the amount of people were caught in its middle so caught in its midst so that's why I felt it was so important to be there and um, to be on the front line essentially uh, to, to see it because very often if you're you know if you're not if you're not there at the time, you're not really there on the front line by the time you get there things are going to be cleaned up you won't really know what exactly has happened the scenes will be gone so um that's the that's the 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 trouble or the the line you're trying to walk <clears throat> um i like these two pictures together because this this is earlier in the day in the same house in in a re residential neighborhood before the the soldiers go out on an operation um and then later in the day, uh, after they've they've gone out and pushed into this neighborhood, they recovered this young girl who'd been who'd been injured. Um, uh, we think in an, in an airstrike uh, that had been carried out earlier, um, back to the the same house where we'd started out in the morning, and um, and and we're treating her on the you know on the floor, the same floor that the soldiers were were sleeping on in. Uh, in the morning, so I kind of liked the way these two pictures went together, um, and yeah, summed up the uh, the goings on of most days. You were you were there in Mosul. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, an Iraqi soldier firing on uh, ISIS positions less than uh, five hundred meters away in a residential neighborhood and I mean really shows the the kind of urban nature of the fighting and the, the the way it was being conducted from house to house in in people's in people's homes very often um and I mean I also love the fact that he's wearing shorts and a pair of flip-flops um although he's uh he's part of the Iraqi special forces And, and this is, yeah, this is a very strange picture, a very different picture in many ways, um, but one which I uh, particularly like myself uh, because it, it kind of talks about the, um, the softness that you often saw or that you see sometimes in, in soldiers who are fighting um, in, in the midst of a war like this. And so these are, domesticated birds that they've come across and um, people love keeping birds in Iraq, uh, particularly uh, homing pigeons, but then also songbirds like uh, I think it's a, a canary in the in, in the cage. 
Um, and so the soldiers came across these birds after liberating this area that had been left behind by whoever owned them. And um, uh, in the midst of this like destroyed city, saved these two birds and they were just sitting on the, on the sofa of this, uh, of this like uh, evacuated, evacuated home. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I really like this picture. Um, this is towards the end of the fight for, for Mosul in the old city where the most brutal uh, fighting took place because ISIS were essentially trapped in this very small area of western Mosul right on the, the river Tigris, uh, which was uh, ancient, the ancient part of Mosul. And um, uh, they were corralled into this, this tiny, tiny area surrounded on all sides with no escape um, and uh, were just... Uh, bombed into oblivion over the course of uh, a month or so. Um, and, and this is the kind of, you know, the kind of uh, scene uh, there in the end. Um, uh, this would have been in, in July uh, of 2017. Yeah. Um, and, and this is from that same kind of time. Um, when I was, yeah, I was there with the special forces guys as they were uh, clearing these last, yeah, these last pockets of ISIS resistance in the old city. You can see in the background is completely destroyed. And um, uh, a man came out uh, on this particular morning with this young boy uh, claiming to be, he was claiming to be a civilian and claiming to have just found this boy wandering on the street. And, and that's why he had, uh, he had carried him out. He, he didn't know anything more about him. And so the soldiers at this point were incredibly suspicious of anyone uh, who managed to, you know, survive until this point in that area and who, you know, who was coming out of that area, particularly men of fighting age, they presumed that pretty much all of them were, were probably ISIS. Uh, and so uh, after interrogating him and, and, you know, they didn't really believe his story, uh, uh, they took, took him away um, and then were left with this young boy who they didn't know any, anything about. And yeah, one of the uh, most bizarre, incredible things I, you know, I saw throughout all my, my time covering Mosul happened and uh, the soldiers, the commander in charge decreed that one of his men was going to adopt the boy. And so they washed him and, and um, washed his clothes uh, before this, uh, one of the officers um, came to, to take him away. And it ha it all happened very quickly. And it was in, you know, it was in the middle of a, a very difficult uh, moment and, and time in, in the conflict. And, um, it was very hard to, you know, to delve into it and, and find out what was going on. It was only afterwards that I tried to follow up and, uh, you know, wondered what had happened to this boy and like, had he actually been adopted by this man? And uh, to this point, I haven't been able to, to, to fully find out what happened. I've got conflicting reports uh, and I've not been able to track down the boy for, for sure. Um, and I, it, it could be partly because they don't want anyone to really know where he is because he was adopted, which is essentially uh, um, uh, not something they, they should have done. Um, um, and so, yeah, some of the stories I've heard is that the, the boy was actually reunited with uh, some of his family that had survived. But honestly, I don't know what to believe. Um, but it's still... It still troubles me to this day that I don't know what happened to him. I hold out hope that I will one day be able to find out what happened to him. <clears throat> this is a particularly graphic image that I know is hard to look at, but it's a very important um, point or, or image in a way um, because it speaks to the level of killing that took place at that time in the, in the, in the end in Mosul. This was uh, clearly the scene of... Um, uh, Ex execution, uh, where a group of men, some of some of whom had their hands tied, were clearly gunned down in um, um, in a group together, um, and you know it was very hard to piece together these these scenes. Um, 
uh, and find out what had happened. And for the most part, I don't think anyone really cared because a lot of these uh, guys would have uh, would have been presumed to be ISIS. And um, I realized <laughs> through all my time there that rules the rules around conventional warfare went out the window when we were, you know, the West and and Iraqi forces were fighting ISIS. Um, all sorts of uh, uh, war crimes and um, uh, Geneva Convention uh, decrees were were broken on the battlefield, and it it it, it struck me because um, I'd, I'd never really witnessed that before, and um, I think it was unique because it, it had been a while since the world had had an enemy so. Uh, hated in ISIS, and it was so you know black and white to many people that these guys were bad. So it, it, it you know it somehow became okay to do this kind of stuff, and yeah, no one ever really looked into it much. But you know, I had that, in the end, I started to to document this as much as I could because I also felt it was important. Uh, this this uh, similar scene, but um, this guy is still alive. Uh, an ISIS ISIS guy they they found hiding in a building who'd survived their their onslaught in this area, and they uh, they kind of let him surrender and took him out of the building. But at this is uh, at this point I was stopped from taking any more pictures and and told to go away. Um, and I'm you know uh, very certain he was taken around the corner and executed uh, as well, which was you know, uh, very uh, common at that at that time. And this is the, you know, the level of destruction that was carried out in the old city. That's the River Tigris there. And, and you know, this would have been an area of um, two, three story buildings that, that was in the end pretty much a pile of rubble and a graveyard with thousands of people um, buried underneath the rubble. Um, and then we're moving on to Syria here. So like after Mosul in Iraq fell, um, ISIS largely started to fall back um, first to the border regions with Syria and then, you know, and then um, really to, to Raqqa, which was their, their original, the original capital of their, of their caliphate. Um, Raqqa is um, in, in Northeast Syria. And um, yeah, so as, as soon as Mosul was taken back in, in the summer of 2017, focus switched towards Raqqa and uh, the you know, coalition forces, although they'd al already been fighting in, you know, backing the Kurdish Syrian forces who were fighting ISIS, uh, they really uh, started to focus their efforts then on, on Raqqa and, and defeating ISIS in Syria. And so we, you know, a lot of journalists who've been covering Mosul ended up uh, following the story on to Raqqa. And so this is from that time in October, um, October of 2017, when the, the operation was, was kind of um, reaching its, uh, its culmination. And I was there for a couple of weeks um, in time for uh, the announced liberation, but it was, it was, it was very difficult to, to cover. It was very difficult to get access. Um, and so I was left trying to tell the story through meeting people, you know, who had survived, who had, who had been fighting, in this case, these two soldiers, or with uh, civilians, refugees who'd managed to escape and were, you know, were living in camps because it was very difficult to get access to the front lines. The Kurdish, uh, Syrian Kurdish forces um, backed by the Americans were, were much more difficult to, to work with in many ways and, and uh, to get access to than the Iraqi forces were. Uh, but I, I still, you know, I still really uh, think this is an important picture and talks about the, uh, the cost that um, the, the Kurds in Syria um, and uh, yeah, Syrians uh, in general who fought ISIS paid so these were two two comrades who were injured in the same incident a couple of days before and were in hospital together and I, I managed to get in and interview them and, and then their lunch came and 
this in, in, incredible scene unfolded where uh, one of them had to feed his friend who's both, you know, both his arms were severely injured in, in casts. And I just thought um, it was a, a really poignant moment between two men who had seen uh, the worst of uh, humanity and but were yet, um, yeah, just still human themselves and still caring. And um, I, yeah, I love these moments um, that contradict, in a way, stereotypes contradict <laughs> the, you know, the the idea that a that a, a soldier is um, is maybe. Um, yeah, a tough, uh, macho guy with no feelings. Yeah. And, and, you know, these were the other scenes we were, we were able to cover during that time of funerals because, um, uh, the Kurds paid a huge price. The Kurds, you know, in, in Northern Syria paid a huge price in fighting ISIS and lost, uh, thousands of their of their young men very young men who had taken up arms to fight against isis and so um they were you know they were mourned on mass celebrated on mass in, the, in these huge funerals that um that would take place so this is one of those um these are some civilians who had survived the the fighting in in raqqa and managed to get out at the end and were some of the few civilians I managed to meet at that time because, um, again, because of access, but also because there weren't that many people uh, stuck in, in rock in the end. Um, and so this was one of the few occasions where I did. And um, the situation in rock in the end was, was incredibly, incredibly difficult. So people were mm, on the brink of starvation. They had no food. There was no electricity, no running water. And it was really palpable when I saw this family and they were given some bread and, and food for the first time in probably months. And um, they just devoured it. <clears throat> And this is back in Mosul, actually later in, yeah, later in the, in the autumn, a couple of months after the, the war had ended, when there was this huge uh, operation taking place, uh, mainly carried out by the civil defense, um, Iraqi civil defense workers who were helping families to um, find the bodies of their loved ones that were, you know, that were killed during the fighting and they hadn't been able to recover because the fighting was ongoing and they had either fled or, yeah, they couldn't get to, to where it had happened. So I followed, you know, I followed these, these workers around for a week or so and did a, yeah, did a dispatch about them and, and the people they were helping. And this was one of the women whose, yeah, whose uh, sister and, and niece were killed in an airstrike uh, carried out by um, NATO NATO forces targeting ISIS in the old city. And she was there supervising because what, hap what had to happen is the family members had to help the civil defense workers locate their, their homes. And we, it was really difficult because you can see the landscape they were dealing with. It was very hard to, to figure out where anything was. So this is, uh, yeah, the same, the same scene. And you can see uh, Nadira, the 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 lady who, whose family it was up in the top right corner of the frame there um literally directing the 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 workers where she thinks they were when they were killed and then later in the day they did they found um they found this this was her her sister's uh body um which was uh, in, a, in a kind of pantry kitchen area um and uh yeah it was it was perhaps one of the most um heart-wrenching stories i worked on during the whole time because um uh, it was just yeah the 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 consequences of a war like this boiled down to um it's it's essence after some you know some months of quiet and and having you know, the, the war having ended and yet here were people uh, who were still being devastated by it, even though it was it was over. And this is what war is like. I've you know I've noticed that the effects of it will be felt for for years, afterwards, decades, not just months. 
And again, this is something I'm, I'm uh, interested in, I think is really important to document. So instead of, you know, leaving as soon as, as soon as the bang bang is over and you think it's not exciting anymore, it's so important to keep going back and documenting the aftermath. Uh, this is also, you know, one of the residual effects of uh, of ISIS and uh, the the process that's still going on to this day of um, security forces hunting down um, people they believe to have been members of ISIS who have, you know, kind of melted back into society and are trying to live a normal life. So these SWAT, you know, kind of SWAT teams trained by the Americans very often because this is what the Americans were doing. Uh, post 2003, um, as well in Iraq, hunting down uh, militants and and yeah, you could see the how these Iraqi guys had had um, learned from from the Americans and um, were yeah were really tough, heavy handed in their approach. Um, and I spent yeah again spend some time with them as they would go out on these night raids and uh, target. Um, suspects who had usually been informed on by their by their neighbors or family members for being members of ISIS. And this is all it took. And this is what was very troubling about it in a way was that all it would take is uh, the word of someone else to say that uh, uh, this person was a member of ISIS for an operation uh, against them like this to be launched. Um, and there's you know a lot of questions to be asked about the, the the process in itself and then the judicial process afterwards in iraq there are uh tens of thousands of um of young men particularly young men in prison in iraq uh who are being held um with uh, with very little evidence against them so um you know it's it's one of the complicated parts of the 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 whole kind of reign of ISIS is it's it's very hard to identify who did what and who was you know who was living where during their control because no one had access to those areas at the time so it is based true it's based purely on the the accounts of uh, of other people who were there and uh, it's it's very hard to back up with evidence so this is one of the the lasting kind of effects and um uh yeah cause of um uh sectarian divides probably again in iraq where the mm, poor uh sunni uh parts of the country that were that were held by isis are now living under heavy scrutiny for for their role during that time again this is the you know this is the old city where those last kind of weeks of battle took place where i kept going back to 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 document the process of clearing it a lot of this area is still destroyed um to this day this is this is already about a year after the the war ended and and nothing had changed and these guys were still pulling bodies out of the rubble so that gives you a sense of um uh the level of destruction that took place Again, it's the same, you know, the, the same guys who were in charge of collecting the remains of uh, people who were found in those areas. And the, again, they were largely deemed to be ISIS members if no one had come forward and claimed, claimed their bodies. So what they were doing was just um, uh, collecting their bodies and then burying them in these, in these mass graves. Uh, in um, uh, the the kind of municipal rubbish dumps outside Mosul, um, which I couldn't you know I couldn't quite get my head around um, at the time, um, and again is you know is is slightly troubling in many ways because there was no real forensic evidence uh, being gathered as to who these people really were. It was just like, well, no one's come forward. No one's like claimed their family members. So they're probably ISIS. So we're just going to bury them without any record in this mass grave. Um, again, like I said, there, uh, there were so many things that happened during this conflict that um, simply wouldn't have happened in other conflicts because of the level of uh, kind of unanimous hatred towards ISIS. 
And then uh, towards the end um, of the book and, and my time covering uh, Mosul and, and Iraq, and as much as I am still covering these parts of the world, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's often for different stories these days, but um, you know, at the end of my time covering the, the kind of um, the fight against ISIS, I started to notice how quickly life was coming back to these places. And this is one of the um, remarkable things about somewhere like Iraq and Syria. And we've all noticed it. I think those of us who have covered the region for, for years um, and people's um, ability to rebuild and carry on. And I know it's quite cliched in a way and um, simplistic, but it is remarkable to someone like me who's had a very privileged life to watch people who've had everything taken away from them, um, you know, to, to get on with life, you know, and get through stuff that would most likely break all of us who have had these very privileged, soft upbringings, you know. So these were young students in Mosul University who were going back to um, some some classes that had restarted less than less than a year after the the war had ended. And as you can see, it was heavily destroyed the, the university. Um, but this was this was the nature of you know this was the nature of the young people um, in Mosul. They wanted to get back to their studies that had been on hold for years and reclaim their uh, their lives in a way. And so then like this would have been uh, the first graduating class uh, from Mosul University uh, after ISIS had been uh, pushed, pushed out and defeated in Mosul. And I, yeah, I managed to, to attend their graduation party and it was just one of those um really uh beautiful uh moments that uh, that I got to witness after so many years and um uh witnessing so much uh death and destruction in Mosul to see moments like this were really uh really beautiful and inspiring so this is kind of how the the book ends in a way on a on a more positive note and then the same thing was going on in Raqqa as well, which was perhaps even more heavily destroyed than Mosul. Uh, went back during um, the holy month uh, of Ramadan in 2018, uh, because uh, it was the first Ramadan after uh, ISIS had been defeated. And we wanted to see what that looked like in, in a place like Raqqa that was so heavily destroyed and um, uh, where people had been, you know, had been living uh, in fear for years or living under ISIS's rule for years uh, with very little and people were coming back to uh, to their homes for the first time just for just for Ramadan to see family who had been stuck there and so there was you know a lot of families being reunited for the first time and uh, we spent we spent uh, a week or so in in Raqqa during that time this barbershop was giving all the young kids uh, their fresh cuts for uh, for Ramadan and a small uh, funfair uh, theme park uh, in the middle of the city that uh, had managed to reopen uh, some, you know, some of its rides just in time for for the holidays it was another beautiful sign of life coming back and people um, enjoying themselves uh, even, you know, even in the midst of uh, so much hardship. You know, at this point, and Raqqa is still heavily destroyed and in need of massive. Re construction but at this time it was you know it was very soon after the the fighting there had ended and um but yet these these few days were were filled with a lot of uh joy and and happiness which yeah was really nice to see um at the same kind of time these young kids it's uh customary for young boys on uh you know on eid to uh arm themselves with pellet guns and rain terror down on their their neighbors and families so i thought this was this uh, it was kind of a um uh interesting interesting scene in a way and um they, they seemed to know exactly what they were doing and were perhaps more um, uh, militarily aware than your average K-12 
kid uh, living in the Arab world and uh, were operating like, like a real little squad. And I think probably because they had lived through so many years of, uh, of war in, in, in Syria and in, you know, under ISIS in particular. And yeah, this is the, this is the book that kind of, uh, the image that ends the book and um, where I'm gonna stop <laughs> talking. Um, and it's from that same, that same period in, uh, in Syria, covering Raqqa during Eid in 2018. And we found this family who were returning for the first time to their destroyed home to, to visit other family members, having, having been, been living in a, in a camp further, further north. And we followed them into the city as they were, you know, as they were going home. And um, I just, yeah, just noticed how uh, their, you know, particularly the kids' eyes were were just out on stalks, transfixed on the the level of destruction um, that that they were seeing in in their in their hometown um, and. That's where I'm gonna where I'm gonna end this. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I think um, they're gonna be relayed back to me, and I'll try and answer them as best I can. Thank you for listening. I hope it was interesting. Uh, yes, sir. There's one uh, question here for you. Mm -hmm. um, how does working in this region affect you personally, and how do you debrief, unwind, etc.? Yeah, that's, that's a good question and a, a complicated one in many ways. Um, it's uh, it, it definitely takes takes its toll doing this kind of work and it's probably uh, affected me in different ways at different times. But at the same time, I've learned how to deal with it, uh, especially the longer I've done this. Um, uh, so, you know, in the beginning, I think you're much more susceptible to uh, struggling with, uh, with, with seeing this kind of stuff and working these kind of uh, places. Um, and I definitely did. Um, but, you know, the older you get, if you manage to kind of survive those earlier years, the, the better you get at, at coping and, and finding ways to cope. And what I've learned, I, I guess, is that, you know, you don't want to uh expose yourself for too long on any given trip you know i try and i try and limit my time on the ground for these these kind of assignments to a couple of weeks and then you you know you get home and you maintain a relatively normal routine and schedule at home that's important and then um you know working with good people on the ground and working um with a good organization that helps you and supports you in what you do which i'm lucky to have that's the best way I can answer that. Thank you. Thanks for listening.